uh, to welcome you to our uh, meeting of Global Health and Medical Ethics. Uh, as you know, today is the uh, second uh, seminar in, in the series that, that will run all through the year. I think a total of 25 sessions. Uh, Shola Olapati and I and Fumi Olapati uh, helped organize this with, with great assistance from John Schneider, uh, who in a moment will, will introduce our speaker today. Uh, I just wanted to say a few very brief words about the next two weeks. Um, anybody who doesn't want to come next week, it's all right with me. And, and there's a reason for it. The speaker next week is a wonderful man named Don Hopkins. Don Hopkins was my TA in anatomy. When I started medical school here in September of 1963, and he may remember that, and if he does, I'm going to be embarrassed, okay? Because I had to have been the worst anatomy student in history. Uh, but he went on to a, an extraordinary career, um, uh, working primarily through the Carter Center in Atlanta and helping to um, eradicate guinea worm disease in Africa. So if Don doesn't talk about being my TA, his talk will be worth hearing, okay? And then the following week, uh, an old friend to, to many in the room, Pierce Gardner, who for many years was our program director in internal medicine here and in the infectious disease section, and has now gone off to uh, Stony Brook and to the NIH, where he's particularly interested in encouraging students to do global health rotations. And he's working with Holly Humphrey's office and others here at the medical school. Um, and Pierce will be doing both our session and a, a session over at the medical school earlier in the morning uh, for Howard. With, with, that, with that anticipatory thing, if anybody needs schedules, I'm going to send some of them down. Uh, these, these are the year-long schedules. Um, I'm going to ask John Schneider if he'd be kind enough to uh, present and introduce Ken Mayer, uh, who's our distinguished guest today. John. Thank you, Mark. Um, so it's an honor and privilege to uh, bring uh, Ken Mayer to the University of Chicago. Um, Ken has some roots in, uh, in Chicago. He did his uh, medical education at Northwestern uh, University uh, before going to Boston um, for training, uh, both residency and fellowship. And now uh, Dr. Mayer is a professor of medicine and of community medicine at Brown University. Um, he's also the director of research at the Fenway uh, Community Health Center, or Fenway Institute, which is um, one of the, the largest and, and most well-recognized uh, healthcare centers for uh, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender population. Um, he, his international career um, started uh, probably in the early, mid-80s, when he had um, some trainees at Brown who were from India, and he developed relationships, uh, collaborative research relationships that then uh, became uh, research projects that then went into Fogarty uh, programs. He has a, uh, he's a director of the uh, Fogarty AIDS International Training Program, which has a number of sites in uh, Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, and Brown University AIDS program, a lot of other uh, HIV-related programs. But his work um, is predominantly focused on HIV prevention, both domestically uh, and internationally, mostly in India. Uh, and so he has a, a lot of wealth of experiences and, and understanding of the local and global context. So delighted to have him here today. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you, Dr. Sigler, Dr. Alapati, uh, for um, this kind invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure being back here in Chicago. And what, what's nice about academia, you really have uh, um, sometimes a sense of continuity. Uh, here with one of my mentors, uh, David Ostra, who's a loyal alum of the University of Chicago here, who really was the genius behind setting up Howard Brown, and, and very instrumental in my, when I came to Boston working in a similar community health center as Howard Brown. Um, uh, Fenway uh, Community Health and really started seeing some of the first people with HIV AIDS in New England. So I, I certainly owe uh, David a debt of gratitude and it's a pleasure working with John. We spent the morning going over data on, on a project and, and I mean that's why we do this work is really to um, help, help the world and also help the next generation of our colleagues so we can all advance new knowledge. I'm also um, 
would be remiss in not acknowledging somebody who I really think has contributed enormously uh, fr here at the University of Chicago to our understanding of the issues I'm going to be talking about today, and that's Dr. Ed Lauman and his, his colleagues who have really helped us understand how to do population-based studies around many of these sensitive issues. So, you know, my, my, my point of departure is that we're now in a global gene pool. Um, I wrote a book, or uh, edited a book called The Social Ecology of Infectious Diseases, and the reason why I want to spend a lot of time today talking about men who have sex with men and lessons from the epidemic um, is that there, there are issues of what we've learned in the U.S. that may have impact globally and, and vice versa. Um, so in terms of uh, the U.S. epidemic, um, we are doing a great job in treating HIV, but about half the people who are HIV infected in the U.S. are either unaware of their HIV infection or not stably in care, and we're seeing um, a, re a continued rise of the epidemic. So the half a million people who are in care um, are living longer lives, so there's more people living with HIV, which is a good thing, but there also are 56,000 new HIV infections a year in the United States, with about half of them being among men who have sex with men. And people tend to think of, of the global epidemic as um, uh, gay men in the U.S. and in Europe, uh, and then, um, you know, and maybe a few other urban epicenters, Australia, uh, Cape Town maybe, and then, and then there's the heterosexual epidemic uh, globally, and, and think of them as dissociated, but that's really not the case. So this, this slide is just uh, summarizing a bunch of recently published studies, and there really is a global MSM epidemic. So what you see in the, in the maroon, if you compare it to the blue, is blue is the MSM survey figures from epidemics, and the, um, the maroon is the national um, figures for different epidemics. So you can see Senegal, over 20% of men who have sex with men, HIV infected, uh, low percentage of general population. And this is true across the world, whether it's Cambodia, Thailand, if you're looking in Ukraine, Ar Argentina. So you have concentrated epidemics um, among a subpopulation within these populations. This is important both from a human rights standpoint for the individuals who are infected themselves, because in many of the countries where these individuals are uh, HIV in infected, they're not able to access services because of either criminalization or because of societal <laughs> stigma. So, th so there's um, the basic human rights sets of issues uh, when we're focusing on, on bioethics. But there's also um, the epidemiologic concerns because uh, many of these individuals, particularly in societies where um, being married is the norm and male privilege being what it is, uh, men are forced into relationships even if they uh, prefer having sex with other men. Uh, they're not uh, having access to prevention messages in those settings, and they therefore are a bridge population of transmitting HIV into the general population. So there's, there's ethical and epidemiologic reasons why we really have to pay attention to this. So this cartoon says, no, we are not twins. So one of the key take-homes is that there's, there's not a homogeneous sort of uh, clone that, that is associated with HIV or risk behavior around the world, but rather we're, we really have to think about the fact that there are multiple determinants of sexuality. So as I mentioned, Dr. Lauman really is um, the dean here of our thinking about these, these issues. And so you have earlier data, a lot of convenient samples from Kinsey report, much more careful work that's been done by Dr. Lauman and subsequent uh, uh, sexual health researchers um, since then. And we have to think about when we're talking about uh, sexuality that there really are differences between identity behavior and attraction. And um, uh, his data and other data you know, su suggest varying figures, but you find that uh, people may have lower levels of identity, uh, but may, many people may be acting in a certain way who may not identify with a specific population, which is why I tend to use the term of art, men who have sex with men, because that's more broad and inclusive term. So somebody doesn't necessarily have to um, identify as gay or feel that they're accepting a role that they're not comfortable with. But uh, from an epidemiologic standpoint, we have to focus on behaviors because that's what transmits, uh, um, transmits the virus. But if we're trying to develop prevention programs and trying to be sensitive to different cultures, we have to also understand how do people identify themselves, how are people attracted, and try to deal with each of these specific uh, ways in which uh, people's complexities about sexuality manifest themselves. So this is a slide uh, from India. Uh, these. Um, by subsequent interviews, my colleagues at Humphrey Park Trust identified that, that these are not men who are having um, sex with each other, uh, but this is a uh, cultural um, expression of affection. And in point of fact, uh, one of the groups that we work with in India, the Humpsafar Trust, which is the largest um, NGO, um, it's based in Mumbai and does um, incredible community-based work, uh, 
in, uh, those of you who've worked in India know that with, uh, whether it's related to castes or um, big populations, people like classification. So Hamsafar tried to try to um, have this grid of you know, sexual behavior and sexual identity and came up with all these different universes. And the idea of the Venn diagram is that there's some overlap, you know. So Koti are um, effeminately uh, identified males. Panti are um, men who are phenotypically uh, male but have sex with other males. Uh, in the 21st century now, we have, we have the internet. So you have in the same city, Mumbai, people who may be adopting very traditional roles that go back uh, millennia. So hijra are transgender individuals, and there's actual you know, um, scriptural writings that would identify people who are transgender, and there's certain roles in society that transgender individuals um, relate to. But there are also people who are, quote, gay identified. These are people who are online, maybe meeting partners are on online, um, tra traveling, getting to the West a lot, um, and having contact with, with lots of uh, people from the West. So having very similar um, social construction of reality um, as people living in Chicago, for example. So there, there are complexities to these realities, but we have to think about how do people think and how they behave to um, create effective prevention interventions. So my thesis really is that what we have, if we're going to be dealing with this um, global epidemic, we have to think about it as multiple micro epidemics and understand what are the factors that potentiate risk in different settings. Um, there are biological cofactors that I'd like to touch on today about um, social vulnerabilities that make people more susceptible to HIV. Uh, mental health issues and substance use issues are, are areas that David has done uh, pioneering work on. And I'd like to point out in terms of interventions, um, in the 21st century we have to think about physical and virtual venues. There are a lot of ways that people can meet online and we have to um, get our prevention interventions up to date with the technologies. Um, and structures, and I'd really like to end with is uh, many of you here who are clinicians, uh, the role that you can play in uh, prevention as well. So first of all, you know, not everybody who identifies um, as a man having sex with men uh, is equally at risk for HIV. So we were involved, um, Fenway was one of six sites of um, the largest NIH uh, behavioral intervention to try to decrease HIV transmission among men who have sex with men. It's called the EXPLORE study. It enrolled 4,295 men several years ago. And unfortunately, the intervention, which was a 10-session, highly uh, stylized protocol, was not very effective. It, it had about a 20% uh, percent reduction in, in HIV incidence, which was borderline statistically significant. But the control group also improved a bit, so it really was not, this was uh, not, a, not a great behavioral intervention, which is why we have to go back and figure out much more focused interventions for different subpopulations. But it had a lot of power because it had about a 2.1% um, annualized incidence over several years. So there were several hundred people who became infected. So we know more about the predictors of HIV incidence in this population than any other population uh, here to date. So the people who were more likely to become infected were younger and were non-white. And I want, we'll want to talk uh, particularly about the disproportionate epidemic among African-American men who have sex with men in the United States. Not a big surprise, people had multiple partners were more likely to be infected, and particularly they had HIV-infected partners, but also status unknown. So non-disclosure was a major factor potentiating transmission as well. Biologically, we're not surprised to find that unprotected anal intercourse um, was associated uh, with transmission, but there were also a few people who be who denied that history and had exposure um, oral sex. So that's a, that's a concern as well in terms of our safer sex messages. And what really came out were the use of non-injection drugs, crystal methamphetamine, Viagra, poppers. Uh, David has uh, done work showing showing this as well. Heavy alcohol as well, sexually transmitted infections, and moderate depression. And I just want to go into a little bit of, of each of these um, in a little more detail. So in terms of substances, um, heavy alcohol use um, had a much higher ha hazard ratio than just about anything else, but a small number of infections. So if you're thinking epidemiologically about the concept of attributable risk, um, there, there were a moderately small number, like 10%, you know, 10 is high for the general population, but among a cohort of men who were recruited because they were risky, MSM, 10% were heavy, heavy drinkers. And what was actually more predictive of becoming infected, even more so uh, than amphetamine, if you think about the attributable fraction, was contextual use of substances. So it was using drugs or alcohol before sex. So uh, about almost three quarters of the cohort reported that. 
and about 205 of the infections occurred in pe people in that kind of circumstance. So in terms of our prevention message, it's not just, um, just say no, don't do this drug, but it's thinking about the context under which people engaging in the risk behaviors that predicts uh, their risk taking. Another very important uh, finding that came out of the Explore study was uh, a paper uh, published by Margaret Chesney and, and uh, um, colleagues uh, in the American Journal of Public Health about three or four years ago. And what you see on the top here are different constructs. So um, the intervention for Explore was kind of a kitchen sink intervention, a lot of different ways that we were trying to intervene in people's risky behaviors. And so um, there was a screening part of the questionnaire uh, uh, before the intervention started, looking at different domains. So self-efficacy were questions, you know, do you feel like you could control your behavior if you could? Um, could? Do you feel like you have the agency to do, th do that? Communi communication skills, do you talk to your partners about condoms you feel comfortable disclosing? Social norms, um, what do your friends think about safer sex? Um, what about sensation? So um, some people enjoy receptive anal intercourse. So, um, you know, does this feel better? Do you do it because it feels particularly good? Do, um, is it more um, uh, to satisfy your partner? So enjoyment was an issue. Alcohol use um, and substance use. And so what you see across uh, these uh, six different domains are different patterns. So some of the people did not have good uh, self-efficacy uh, skills or communication skills, um, did not have peers that were supportive. Um, but didn't particularly enjoy the, um, this practice. We're not um, heavy, heavy um, alcohol users, but we're using drugs around, around sex. And about, that was about 16% of the cohort, and they had an increased risk for, for being risky and for becoming HIV infected. And just the take home, just to get the gestalt, is that here you have um, uh, five different patterns um, and no one pattern was more than 20% of the group. So in other words, this is the concept of microepidemics. If, if your intervention is going to focus on drug use, well, these individuals here didn't have um, um, increased drug use. These individuals here didn't have increased uh, uh, drug use. That's almost 20% of the individuals. So for those individuals, focusing your intervention on substance use wouldn't be very relevant. So this has really led to an error of um, saying that you really have to have tailored interventions for different subpopulations of MSM. Um, I'll bring this all together at the end, but I want to just uh, very briefly switch gears and talk a little bit about biological vulnerability, because one of the other things we found in Explore, uh, again, no big surprise, were that men who had um, intercurrent sexually transmitted infections were more likely to become HIV infected. This cartoon sort of um, shows the complexities of HIV transmission and why it's been so hard to have really effective biological prevention. So at least we know from animal models that HIV can be transmitted as cell-free virus or cell-associated virus, and there are several different cell, cells that can pick up HIV and can lead to productive infection. If you put enough cell-free virus on the mucous membrane, even with intact stratified uh, um, mucous membranes, for example, in the vagina, you can get virus coming across. So you can have transcytotic pathway, um, but you, the, the person you're exposed to has to have a high viral burden that you're being exposed to. There are dendritic cells that um, arborize and that can bind HIV from the surface, and they can migrate and disseminate HIV uh, very quickly. And then ulcerations or abrasions, so um, um, ulcerative STDs like uh, syphilis, herpes, chancroid, or abrasions from traumatic sex can um, lead to HIV transmission. So for rectal mucosa, single cell columnar epithelia, uh, one can imagine that microabrasions are very um, easy to come by in the course of anal intercourse, which is one explanation for the increased um, um, susceptibility uh, for HIV infection. But we know that these um, STDs are also major magnifiers of HIV transmission in this population. So this is data from Fenway uh, Health, which sees about uh, uh, twenty percent of, of the syphilis infections in Massachusetts now, and this line, if you carried out from um, two thousand and five continues to go up we th We thought we were starting to see a dip. our prevention efforts were were um, having some effect, but basically, we went from two cases of syphilis in one thousand nine hundred and ninety seven to now um, more than one hundred and fifty cases at one clinic of, of syphilis um, in two thousand and eight. And it's not a function of just doing more testing. So the test positivity rate is kind of parallel to the number of new infections. So, so it, there really are truly um, more infections occurring. Um, and this is true uh, particularly in HIV-infected men who have sex with men. So people with, living with HIV or living longer, uh, some of these infections um, then potentiate their infectiousness to others um, um, 
who, uh, who are not HIV infected. So this was a study in four U.S. cities. Uh, Providence uh, was one of them, um, Twin Cities, uh, Denver and St. Louis, and not New York, not San Francisco. And these were asymptomatic uh, um, men who had sex with men in care, a cohort of about 600 men, and high levels of rectal chlamydia, syphilis, um, gonorrhea, um, and uh, urethral uh, uh, chlamydia. So that um, really aggressive management of STDs is another part of the, the puzzle. Another piece of the puzzle is herpes simplex. So back to the EXPLORE study, looking at men who were at risk for becoming HIV infected, people who were, if you compare people who are HSV2 antibody seronegative, compared with people who um, recently seroconverted for HSV2 antibodies who had a recent HSV2 infection um, or even a, a remote incident infection, you can see that the um, incidence go, goes up dramatically, goes up several fold because of HSV2. Now, there were two large public health studies that tried to see if you could suppress HSV2 shedding could you decrease HIV incidence? And these studies were unsuccessful. So one of the sad um, um, lessons about STD management is that once you have the STD, you may have an inflammatory milieu in the genital tract and may take a lot more than just treating the acute STD or suppressing things like herpes expression to make people less biologically uh, susceptible. But this is part of what is potentially the um, global MSM epidemic. And I think this cartoon kind of summarizes two trends where people have been trying to think about biological interventions. So when people first become HIV infected, they have a burst of viremia, but it's a very short period of time. So some of the work that's going on in areas where there are hot spots of HIV transmission, this is not just exclusively related to MSM, but certainly in MSM settings, whether it's uh, bathhouses or for injecting drug users, it would be shooting galleries. Can you identify people at this period of time when they first become HIV infected? Because the literature suggests that this is a period where people are highly infectious and they are unaware of their infection and may transmit to others. So this would be one period where you see a lot of virus, but again, it's only a short period of time, and most clinicians miss this period of, of time. Uh, and then at the distal end, uh, there's many years before people develop AIDS so the viral load starts going up. So again, there's more virus in the blood, more virus in the genital tract. Can we intervene there? And during this long quiescent period where people are not um, symptomatic with HIV, maybe unaware of their infection, it's the sexually transmitted infections that upregulate HIV expression in the genital tract that are a target, still an elusive target, for trying to make infected people less infectious and trying to make um, uninfected people less susceptible. Um, let's get from there uh, to go to syndemics. The other big concept we have to think about is that there are multiple um, early events that um, predict why people are more likely to engage in risky behavior. And Ron Stahl, a uh, colleague of uh, David's and mine, uh, uh, was involved in a four-city study, a um, gay urban men's study, that found very high levels of depression, substance use, childhood sexual abuse, uh, 25 to 30 uh, plus percent in uh, his sample, samples here in Chicago and other, other studies, and partner violence. And these epidemics tended to, tended to potentiate each other so that whether it was uh, likely to be being HIV infected or likelihood to be engaging in risky behavior, um, each behavior, uh, excuse me, each problem predicted uh, risky behavior and they tended to co-vary and people who had more than uh, uh, one problem were much more likely to be risky, much more likely to, uh, to become HIV infected. Um, in studies that we've done in Boston, looking at HIV-infected men who have sex with men in care, and, and David has similar data here in Chicago, you can find high prevalence of depression, post-traumatic stress, and that, that, um, that may be due to early childhood events or um, early trauma um, at the early days of the AIDS epidemic, but a lot, of other, um, a lot of other concomitant mental health issues. So trying to develop interventions uh, really have to address these, these issues. And we found in our sample very high incidence of childhood sexual abuse uh, predicting um, um, risky uh, behavior. So um, there are a number of different um, cognitive models about why people engage in risk or don't use condoms. Uh, you know, that people may want to prevent um, disease, but um, the condoms reduce pleasure. Uh, there may be socialization issues, so uh, your peer norms, and may affect self-efficacy. But it's really more appropriate, and my colleague C. Safran's really done a lot of work on this, to be thinking about 
all these other issues that, that directly affect each of these issues. And, and David has really paid a lot of attention to this as well. We have to develop um, interventions for the depression or the anxiety uh, for the substance use issues if you're going to really have an impact here in any way, shape, or form. Um, these are a number of snapshots. I promise you we're going to um, synthesize this in a couple of minutes. But one of the other populations that we have to focus on here in the United States when we talk about um, the um, global epidemic and we have, we have sort of the fourth world where we have um, under, underserved societies within the United States, within urban America, uh, black men who have sex with men. And very different pattern um, of, of, of um, prevalence, a pattern of risk here compared to other men who have sex with men in the United States. Because there's higher HIV prevalence than any other population of men who have sex with men in the US, but lower rates of risk-taking behavior. So what we're seeing here is much more of a prevalence pool phenomenon. Um, very careful review by Greg Millett in AIDS, uh, several reviews by Greg and Ron Stahl and American Journal of Public Health basically show that it t the issues are that black men who have sex with men tend to have partners from within their own community. It doesn't mean that they're not interracial um, contacts, but they're, you're more likely to have a partner from your own race, ethnic group. And there are high rates of um, bacterial, viral S SDIs uh, that are potentiating transmission, and that it's more of a network phenomenon that people are less likely to uh, know that they're HIV infected, more likely to uh, delay seeking care. So it's the, um, and um, focus groups and unquantitative work has shown that, the, um, that there's sort of a dual stigma that uh, the individuals are dealing with, where there's perception of lack of acceptance within the African-American community, and there's a certain amount of racism within um, the um, gay community. Interesting, we just went to sleep. Okay. I didn't do anything. Anything we can do to? <laughs> I put the computer to sleep. It's not a good sign. <laughs> uh, so, so what? Uh, the point. The point about um, uh, talking about the Black MSM again is this, this idea of multiple microepidemics. That in epi that in dealing with those dynamics, one has to think about not just in, in intervention at the individual level, but at the community level, and th there may be lessons there for other populations. Uh, so um, through NIH funding, we're currently engaged. All right. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So, so the take home is that interventions based on individual risk behaviors may not they may not be sufficient to prevent um, HIV transmission in this population. So, what you have is um, sort of a confluence of several different factors in the epidemiology that may suggest a much more complex intervention is necessary. And this may be true as well for interventions in other parts of the world for men who have sex with men. So you have to think about how to get people to test because there's low frequency of testing. Uh, so people who are unaware that they're HIV infected are more likely to engage in transmission behaviors. And if, if people are having contact with each other who are acutely infected, there may be these hot spots where needing to use newer diagnostic technologies to pick up acute infection may be necessary. Um, the high prevalence in the networks, um, you really want to tap into these networks. So one of the big questions would be, can you incentivize people within a network to get people who are their uh, partners to come in to get tested, to come in uh, for care, to get, come in for prevention services? Uh, trying to uh, really um, tap into um, diminishing these sexually transmitted infections for primary prevention so that you don't have this highly inflammatory genital tract milieu is another challenge. And then trying to deal with barriers, um, institutional barriers that people perceive to get into care. So there are a number of different things that can be done. And one of the newer um, uh, modalities for engaging people is called health system navigation. 
This was developed by Harold Freeman at Harlem Hospital uh, in New York, finding that African American women were not accessing mammography services. This is about 20, 30 years ago. And by, by training near peers, uh, the women were more likely than to engage in the healthcare system and to get mammograms. And this has been adapted by um, Health Resource Service Administration, HRSA, in several demonstration projects to help people who are out of care, who are living with HIV, to get into care. So one of the things that we're doing through um, funding from the National Institute of Health is trying to see if health system navigation can be adapted for black MSM to train near peers to help people with both prevention services as well as treatment. So the HRSA funded interventions uh, a few years ago that were summarized by my colleague Judy Bradford um, a couple years ago, um, they did show that people um, who are not in care were more likely to stay in care if they had a peer who was helping them to get to appointments. They were more likely to be adherent to their medications and to be retained in care. And this was actually associated with the biological outcome with a decrease in plasma viral load. So this, this um, you know, there's at least some hard data supporting uh, the use of peers. So a new intervention that's uh, underway now in several cities across the United States is trying to see can you find people who are high risk who are an accident waiting to happen, in other words, who have all the reasons why they may become HIV infected, can training a peer and then uh, having the person assigned to a peer actually help them stay safe, um, decrease likelihood of becoming HIV infected. So this again suggests that for this microepidemic, the approach is not just, um, you know, get tested or go on antiretroviral therapy, but you may need a more systemic approach. Uh, one of the other areas that I had mentioned was uh, the different venues. So um, we did a study at Fenway in uh, 2006 and just asked people who came in with a new sexually transmitted infection, where do you think you met the partner um, who, um, who, where you acquired the infection? And you can see 40% um, online, um, and it's, if anything, higher these days. But about 16% of the people um, met partners in a bathhouse or a sex club. Now, it's, you know, other people um, met people um, um, cruising in uh, public places or, or in bars. But the reason why we have focused some attention on bathhouse and sex clubs is because it's, it's Sutton's law. It's, you know, why do you rub banks? That's where the money is. So why not do testing where people are meeting partners uh, for sexual contact? Now, New England, um, interestingly, Boston had zoned out their, um, their bathhouses. So there's no public... Uh, um, funded uh, no public um, uh, sexual environments in, in Boston uh, um, within, within a physical space. Province Rhode Island took a different tack and, and kind of um, has a red light district uh, area and has actually two, two bathhouses. So uh, we started um, doing testing there in the um, bathhouse and we found the prevalence of HIV. 2.5% of the men who access services HIV infected. We found appreciable levels of syphilis and chlamydia and also sexually acquired hepatitis C. And the take-home, uh, this is a little mini clinic that we set up there. Um, we're trying to find uh, support from um, National Institute of Health to actually try to do prevention interventions on site because it's a venue where you have people coming from a wide area and they're there for a few hours. And this, you know, again, it's, this may be a place where you can engage people. The other venue where we have to think about uh, issues is uh, online. So this is Manhunt. This is the most popular site where uh, men who have sex with men meet each other online. They ne uh, they're based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, so we've done a couple projects with them. And they have um, 4 million paid-up members around the world at this point in time. So this is, a, uh, again, a virtual venue. So the advantage of the bathhouse is the person's there. They're in a towel. They might have a little downtime. You could, you could test them. You might be able to do a behavioral intervention online. You don't know who's online, who's not. But it is a place where there's a lot of, a lot of promise. Um, they have this feature, Manhunt Cares. There are multiple other uh, sites like this. But um, this is just one of our adverts that we have at Fenway for um, trying to recruit uh, people into, uh, into studies. Uh, there are other interventions, and David has uh, developed some. There are a number around the country now trying to engage people through uh, streaming videos online, trying, trying to see if you can incentivize people to come in for testing or actually get tested. There's actually a, um, an, uh, an SED testing service where you can you know, pick your menu of SED tests that you want to get online. They'll send you the home test, and then you send them back. So you're, you're doing this all in the privacy of your home. A lot of public health people are not totally comfortable. You want to have the physical person there in front of you, but this is the 21st century, and um, trying to tap into these new technologies is the only way we're really going to get a handle on this very diverse epidemic. So I, I really was 
giving you some snapshots and want to put this now in a, a more of a, con, uh, a context of how an infectious disease specialist sees the way that you stop epidemics. So you can decrease the source of the infection, you can alter host susceptibility, you can alter risk-taking behavior. What I've tried to point out today is that, that the risk-taking behavior is still a tall order, uh, you know, almost 30 years into this epidemic. Certainly there are examples of condom promotion, individual interventions, and couples interventions that have worked. But like diet, exercise, smoking cessation, uh, some people, you know, one intervention, it does it, and that's it for the rest of their lives. And other people need boosters or um, are refractory to some of these interventions. And some of the factors that potentiate HIV transmission for MSM and for other vulnerable populations are structural issues. Um, if the only place you can meet partners is in a bar, uh, um, uh, otherwise you're going to get arrested, you tend to drink alcohol when you're in the bar, so you're going to have uh, substance use. So structural intervention may be finding safe spaces where people can meet um, partners without having uh, to use disinhibiting substances. Just like uh, for women, if you're going to be turned out of your house if you don't have a, um, a baby within nine months because of your mother-in-law, and my colleague in India, Suniti Salman, calls uh, HIV in India mother-in-law's disease because of that uh, pressure, uh, you know, then you have to think about microeconomic uh, means for giving women independent uh, means so that they're, you know, if they are turned out of the house, that they can say, well, fine, I have another way to um, uh, survive. But because we think these are very hard issues, we obviously would like to think about biological interventions if we could. Some of them are no-brainers. Obviously, barrier protection works. It's just that people have to use it. Treating sexually transmitted infections has not been such an easy uh, story, and there have been several trials that have not been successful. The, but the question is, do we just not intervene early enough on these sexually transmitted infections? So maybe primary prevention STI interventions may work. But I'd like to focus a little bit on on the use of antivirals for prevention because antivirals are available. Uh, they're quite amazing, the newer antivirals for treatment. The question is, are they going to be the next best thing for MSM epidemics um, uh, to prevent tra transmission? So in terms of one, one area of antiretrovirals is using antivirals in HIV-infected people. We obviously uh, want to treat people with HIV uh, to have more people living with HIV to promote survival. But another thing that happens when you treat people uh, with HIV, you have a lower viral burden in the blood, you also have less virus in the genital tract, and there's some data that suggests you might have less transmission. So there actually was a paper in Lancet in January by Granich et al. saying that we could treat our way out of the epidemic. If you just test everybody and you get everybody on antiretroviral therapy, you'll um, stop the epidemic in its tracks. And with generic drugs, maybe this is a way, way to go. Uh, but at the same time, you have more people living with HIV. You don't necessarily eradicate HIV from the body when you're treating people. You lower the viral load. But if you have an intercurrent sexually transmitted infection, you may have a bump of um, increased HIV in the genital tract and lead to transmission. If you're not fully adherent to your antiretroviral therapy, the virus may start replicating in the genital tract. And even if the person doesn't clinically fail, they may have um, periods of time when they're off drugs. Um, and those are times where they may be using substances, may be depressed, and that may be why they're not taking the medication. That's a period of time where the person might ha um, be more likely to transmit. So um, test and treat the relevant issues, and there actually are operationals research studies now going on starting in the U.S. and uh, overseas, looking at issues such as access, adherence to medication, uh, prevention for positives, and treating concomitant sexually transmitted infections. But there really has been a revolution since um, colleagues in India uh, more than a decade ago uh, decided uh, that um, um, you know, global uh, trade uh, treaties be damned and were able to uh, make generic uh, antiretrovirals and take fixed dose combinations from several different companies. So, so now with um, the aegis of the Clinton Foundation and other agencies, um, a triple drug regimen, at least a starting regimen, um, in India is about $120 a year. So it's still uh, above the uh, ability of many um, um, people at high risk for HIV to take for prevention on a sustained basis because it's still uh, a substantial amount of money, but it does become a more sustainable issue. And then issues of who should um, benefit and if you have limited amount of money, how much do you put into treatment, how much do you put into prevention uh, are part of the debate that we have to think about when we're thinking about global ethical issues. So the best model we have about antivirals for prevention is using them as post-exposure prophylaxis. There are animal data that suggests post-exposure prophylaxis works. Uh, there are uh, data from healthcare workers, a retrospective case control study that the CDC did. Now, many people have raised the issue of risk compensation. If, if somebody thinks they can take a pill, 
uh, and can protect themselves, are they going to become riskier and engage in more risk? And if we don't think the pill is 100% protective or people aren't 100% adherent, are we actually going to see more infections? Um, risk compensation has been a big bugaboo of this whole area of research, but the best study uh, to date done uh, from UCSF um, combined a behavioral intervention with um, with um, counseling in addition to giving people who presented after a high-risk exposure for, um, for post-exposure prophylaxis and found that by six months the majority of people had decreased the number of risk acts. But you can see over six to twelve months there's what you'd say is regression towards the mean. People start becoming riskier again. So it's not that we can say that PEP is um, the magic bullet but that there may be ways of being um, sophisticated about combining behavioral interventions and um, treatment that we may be able to decrease uh, risk for individuals. But there are certainly are caveats. We've had a large post-exposure prophylaxis program. This is non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis um, at Fenway. We've looked at various regimens that are better tolerated uh, using tenofovir and now using the newer um, integrase inhibitor. But the point is that the majority of people are presenting because they had very risky behavior. Uh, and a lot of them were using alcohol or using recreational drugs. So in addition to um, decreasing um, you know, telling people how do you reduce your risk, you may have to be dealing with counseling around alcohol, de dealing around substance use as, as well. So it has to be uh, part of a prevention package if we're going to gain any traction. But the data on post-exposure prophylaxis, I think, have been very much eclipsed by the sense, could you even protect people before they become exposed to HIV? Uh, and th this, um, these data from um, um, uh, multi-center collaboration we were involved in that were reported in the Journal of Infectious Disease points out the difficulty if you're thinking about antivirals as a strategy for prevention in chronically risky people. This was a group of men who had sex with men in the vaccine preparedness study. They were asked to keep a diary and every week that they engaged in risky behavior they just checked off uh, one of the, this box. So you see that there's some men who are risky all the time. So for those individuals, if we thought that antiviral chemoprophylaxis made sense, they essentially would be on antiviral drugs for the rest of their life. On the other hand, there are quite a number of individuals who only have occasional risk. All of the men in these studies were getting counseling on a regular basis. So if anything, there'd be a secular trend towards de decreasing risk, when one might imagine. But you can see here, some of these individuals, fairly intermittent uh, patterns of risk. So do they really need to be on medication on a chronic basis? And these are really some of the questions we're grappling with now as the field of post-exposure prophylaxis and pre-exposure prophylaxis are coming into their own. So the first big study in the United States that there will be data presented uh, uh, sometime in 2010 is a study of 400 men who have sex with men recruited in Boston, Atlanta, and San Francisco. And uh, these boxes each are 100 men. So this study was answering the question, um, would the drug tenofovir, would the safety profile be sufficient that you would see very few adverse events compared to placebo? And would you, um, you wouldn't necessarily have enough um, power to show decrease in incidence, but what happened to people's behavior? So it's looking at this issue that's um, in treatment research is called the therapeutic misconception. In this case, it's the prophylactic misconception. Do people who take a pill start saying, well, I, you know, I have, I have a little nausea. I started this pill today. I probably got the real thing, and now I'm protected because I wouldn't have gotten into this trial unless I really believed that these drugs worked. So the way to kind of unpack that, um, half the men uh, were randomized to get a pill right away, half placebo, half um, medication. The other half are being followed for nine months, um, um, and every month they're um, filling out a diary and every three months they're uh, having a review. And that's looking at whether these individuals all of a sudden increase their risk when they go on the pill. There's an independent data safety monitoring board for this study and so far um, the study hasn't been stopped so we have to presume that there probably is not a level of behavioral disinhibition that would say that this is a, a dangerous strategy. But this, these are the early days. Um, in the next three, four years, there'll be about eight to ten um, PrEP studies that will mature and we'll have data on um, men who have sex with men for this intervention as well as women at risk for HIV and heterosexual couples. We're involved in a, uh, a PrEP study now in Boston that is an international MSM study bringing together uh, the theme of this talk today. So the study is recruiting at-risk men who have sex with men to see if PrEP works in an efficacy trial. So it's recruiting 3,000 men. It's about 80% um, enrolled now. It's recruiting men in um, Peru, Ecuador, Brazil, 
Thailand, um, South Africa, as well as San Francisco and Boston. So this is the messaging um, that we, the adverts we put in um, the local uh, gay media. Now the question is, is this a message to people who don't read very carefully? Gee, PrEP is already there. Maybe I can borrow my friend's medication. You know, so this is a real concern. Um, you know, before we have proof of efficacy, are people making decisions? Because unlike, say, an HIV vaccine or a topical um, compound of microbicide, um, these medications are available now, so the question is, are people using them? So we did um, c conduct a, st a study um, about PrEP, um, knowing that the antiretroviral therapy is, is available now and could be diverted. And there was a study in San Francisco, and we did one in Boston last year. And we, in both studies, we found uh, with fairly representative samples using respondent-driven sampling, uh, less than 1% of the men had used these medications. So the vast majority of people have not made a decision yet. Um, this is a window in time. This could change with the first positive news overnight. About 20% had heard of the medication. And not surprising for those of you who are behavioral scientists in the room, context really matters. So the interest could be as high as almost 80% of the men were willing, would be willing to use PrEP. You know, if it was cheap, if side effects were, were, um, were very low, um, you know, perceived efficacy. So how the information rolls out about the medication is going to be extremely important. What's interesting as we've done focus groups is that you sort of have antiviral apartheid among men who have sex with men now. So there are many HIV infected um, at risk men who because um, the epidemic is under control in their perception, they're not infected, they don't know anybody who's HIV infected possibly because they're young, possibly because of stigma, people are not revealing that they're infected. Um, their perception is uh, from the old days that these are nasty drugs, that they cause facial wasting, that they have other detrimental side effects. So why would they want to take these medications? Uh, uh, so, so this all could change because the newer medications are better tolerated once we have efficacy data. So um, I, I go into some detail about this because it, um, we're in a window in time where, where things are not happening yet, where with the first couple trials, there may, there may be um, this whole move towards using these medications for prevention. How does this relate to global issues? Well, all of a sudden, access issues for disenfranchised populations about treatment become um, a much larger population of people who might become infected. And how do we equitably ensure that the people who would benefit most from chemoprophylaxis get chemoprophylaxis? And the last piece on the biological issues, uh, microbicides, another Another um, window in time issue is the fact that um, many people have uh, um, advocated for years that since HIV is a mucosally transmitted infection for the vast majority of people around the world, how about um, developing substances that prevent HIV transmission at the mucosa? The argument is you'd have less systemic toxicity than taking pills. You might have more adherence. In many subpopulations, particularly among men who have sex with men, uh, it's preferable to have lubricated sex. So if you have a medication in the lubricant, it's sort of a no-brainer ab about its use. Um, the flip side is that um, if you're using antiviral medications in a lubricant, perhaps you're delivering sub-inhibitory concentrations. Uh, perhaps uh, there are breaks in the mucosa where you're not having enough drug in the submucosa. So this field is being, is being debated. Uh, there are studies now looking at um, topical tenofovir, for example, as well as oral tenofovir. So again, in the next two to three years, we may have data that says lubricants are better than oral agents. And um, it, what may work in one population may not work in another population. May, what may be appropriate for, for women for chemoprophylaxis may not be um, relevant for men who have sex with men. So we have to stay tuned on that issue as well. I want to just wind down uh, by getting us back to the global, the global, global front on many of these issues that we're concerned with. So um, my colleagues and I are involved in two studies of men who have sex with men. Uh, in India, one in uh, Chennai and one in Mumbai. And in, um, in the uh, Chennai study, uh, we, we, we did a respondent-driven sampling uh, um, cohort uh, study and found uh, in, the, in this sample about a fifth of the men were engaging in risky behavior. Only a quarter had uh, participated in a prevention program, even though these were um, uh, self-identified as men who have sex with men. HIV prevalence was 8%. Now, compared to some populations in Africa and some populations in uh, inner city U.S., this is modest. But it, keep in mind that this is um, more than 25%, uh, excuse me, more than 25 times higher than the general population in, in that area of India. So it is a concentrated epidemic among men who have sex with men in Chennai. Multiple partners, non-disclosure being a big, a big issue. 
um, almost 20% of the men married to women. Our data in Mumbai is even higher, um, and including men who are HIV infected. And uh, we've done qualitative work, and many of the men say, you know, my wife would ask questions if, if we, I asked her to pr um, practice uh, protected intercourse. Uh, so that, that is a, a problem. And high levels of depression and substance use. In fact, we did a secondary analysis and found that over half the sample exceeded uh, um, U.S. based, so it's, it's U.S. culture, so we, we don't know what the cultural valence here, but if you use the CSD screen for depression in the U.S., over half the men uh, um, met depression uh, criteria. High levels of anal sex, high numbers of, of partners. Um, 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 effeminate men were more likely to be uh, receptive, but uh, lots of other variables associated with, with risk taking. Uh, the take home um, is that you have a culture where uh, only recently uh, the Delhi High Court uh, decriminalized homosexuality. Still a lot of stigma, still a high uh, premium on marriage. So the ability of people to uh, uh, to receive prevention messages if one has to be covert about, about one's behavior or one expects to be um, judged or stigmatized because of one's behavior makes it very difficult for prevention interventions. So just to wind down, uh, microepidemics uh, do require multiple approaches. Uh, um, I really wanted to show sort of a potpourri of the, the issues and why we have to, as we think about global health, and if we're thinking about the global AIDS epidemic, have to understand that there are multiple uh, different populations and that even among MSM there are different uh, microepidemics. So there obviously are going to be the cultural context, so societies where marriage is, is a priority. We have to think about how we develop prevention interventions when um, non-marriage is, uh, is uh, a way of, um, of becoming uh, highly stigmatized and marginalized in society. Um, trying to think about biological behavioral variables, so uh, preference for lubricants may differ across uh, cultures or the amount of lubrication, so this is going to be a big issue. So we have to think about the precipitating and the potentiating factors. And particularly the example with the black MSM, I think, is going to be relevant for some of the other international settings, thinking about network interventions as opposed to individual in interventions. And I also think that we have to address homophobia, homophobia and healthy sexuality. And I just want to uh, say that, you know, men, uh, men having sex with men, um, it's, it's important to think about the totality of their lives. So here in the U.S., there are a variety of other health concerns. And the more we can wrap in and, and um, uh, co-locate services, that are addressing these other issues, I think the more robust our responses will be in terms of HIV prevention. And I just want to give you a case study of, of how human rights um, come back to reflect on this. This is just from Malawi. So they found, uh, a, a, just like the earlier slide with the high co um, prevalence of HIV and MSM compared to the general population, Malawi has a fairly large generalized epidemic, but again, disproportionately over 40% of MSM in one of the um, one sample were HIV infect already, but their national program, nothing mentioned about MSM, homosexuality is illegal, there's no venue for prevention services, police harassment, no water-based lubricants um, available in the country, and, and so, um, and the government says we don't really collect aid on this population, we don't have these people here. So until, until um, uh, national um, programs really address uh, these issues, we really be, may be missing an important um, driving edge of the epidemic on a global basis. I'd like to end with just um, talking about the challenge for those of you in the room who uh, are involved in patient care. So this was data that Steve Morin and colleagues uh, from UCSF did a survey of Ryan, Ryan White funded clinics from around the United States and asked providers, you know, um, excuse me, ask patients at your last encounter with your provider, did the provider talk about diet and nutrition, emotional issues, antiretroviral adherence? Not, not the best levels of discussion, but you can see here, HIV prevention, a quarter, really um, something that people don't, don't address um, uh, on a, on a uh, sufficient basis. And a lot of this, I think, stems from concerns about attitudes in medicine. You know, we're really still in early days, you know, um, less than... Um, uh, um, 30, um, 35, 36 years ago that the um, DSM uh, removed homosexuality as a mental disorder. Uh, for transgender individuals, that's still a um, uh, DSM uh, diagnosis. Attitudes of physicians are changing, but still 9% uh, uh, within the past decade not referred to a gay pediatrician. Almost 20% um, uh, of physicians saying that they were not comfortable providing care. Uh, to gay patients. Uh, and yet, you know, we talk about cultural competence in terms of taking care of patients who are racial, ethnic, minority patients. But I think 
Um, just like if you are taking care of an African-American patient here, you'd want to know something about dietary history, you'd want to know something about genetics, you'd want to know something about the legacy of Tuskegee and cultural norms when people see somebody in a white coat. So I think as healthcare providers, I think we have a major role in stemming the epidemic in terms of understanding the complexities of the lives of people who are sexual gender minority patients. So, so I, I would really advocate for a holistic approach and um, thinking about the patient as the whole person and I think by doing that, one can contextualize HIV risk and really do a much better job than we've been doing in the past. Little uh, shameless self-promotion. We uh, published the uh, first textbook on um, the, with the American College of Physicians called The Fenway Guide to Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender Health, which really deals with um, much more than HIV prevention, parenting issues, aging issues, um, uh, uh, mental health, substance use, as well as uh, primary care screening for cardiovascular health. And, cancer issues, and hopefully it'll be a useful contribution to the field. Just want to thank my, my colleagues at Fenway um, 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 who share, uh, uh, work together on um, the data I'm sharing with you um, are from our collaborations and funding from NIH, uh, CDC, and our Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Uh, my thesis is enhancing health care is enhancing human rights, and I think we're at an interesting time. I hope some of these biomedical interventions and the cultural awareness is the light at the end of the tunnel. And certainly here in Chicago, we know that we're living in an era of great expectations. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm glad to answer any questions. Yes, please. number of HIV positive patients who are in care but not on therapy, that they're not analogous. And at a global spectrum, it's even higher, just being in care, there's much different thresholds for when to start getting retroviral therapy. And so I don't know that the correlation is as strong as people have been promoting it as whether someone's in care. That's not enough. No, you're completely right. You know, uh, you, know um, you can think of it as, as, as hurdles or, you know, boxes, you know, for first, first getting diagnosed, uh, then getting, you know, having a first visit, um, getting established in care, and then starting treatment, and then being adherent in care, and also dealing with uh, you know, risk-taking risk, risk -taking behaviors in, in that setting if you're going to have a uh, successful approach. They're all important. David. Uh, thank you for your kind comments about the work in Chicago. You were a major part of that, uh, even though you were a freshman medical student, uh, no question. Um, I want to talk a little about oral sex, uh, because you mentioned the uh, finding that they explored that you did have some cases, I don't remember how many they were. Um, that fl fl uh, flies in the face of the studies that I've done in the MAX, Roger Reynolds done in the MAX, and even some of your San Francisco collaborators that the Explore yeah. have, have published papers saying that, um, yes, it's biologically plausible, but we just don't see it. In fact, in the max now, we have a, uh, a term we call it the immaculate conception. And uh, when, when somebody turns up uh, positive and they don't have not reported um, uh, undetected anal sex uh, in the prior six to 12 months, we turn them, those people over to, over to Dick Cheney. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, he gets the truth out of it. But, uh, <laughs> You showed another slide, which, which might be an explanation for that, you, where oropharyngeal gonorrhea and chlamydia uh, were risk factors. Yes. Did you look at that and explore in, in the oral cases? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point. So, so the number of cases are minimal, and then you, um, and you get into the, the problem of, uh, tri you know, um, Attribution of, of infection. So, so for you know, just like with the CDC, if you um, if if you were a man or a woman and you know um, uh, shared needles once, uh, but had you know a, a known HIV infected partner and had a thousand contacts with the partner, you're classified as an IDU because of their hierarchical <laughs> classification. So, likewise, when you're getting sexual histories and you know a lot of these studies, you're seeing people. Um, every few months, you know, uh, Explore was a quarterly elicitation of sexual history. So, A, you, you may, the, you know, the, the reliability has its limitations, but then if you have, you know, if you have one um, anal act and, you know, a thousand oral acts, you're classified as a, a anal risk just because it is so much more, more efficient. So, so the number was very, very small with Explore, and unfortunately, the Explore study, there was, there was no, um, um, prospective gonorrhea chlamydia testing, so we don't don't have that data about 
the extent to which the biological cofactors potentiated that. But that, that would make a lot of sense in that, in that yeah, setting. And, and you made a very good point that this, this is really crucial to, to a lot of our safer sex education. I was just doing that uh, yesterday uh, evening, a session with, uh, with Tom Lyons' uh, cocaine user intervention, where I was the HIV expert. And, and one of the main questions that kept coming up among these men was, you know, what is safe sex? Um, you know, how can they have, they don't want to call it unsafe sex, but how can they have natural sex um, uh, and, and be safe for their partners? Yeah, no, I've been a positive. And of course, I, you know, I, I told them, you know, the, you know, my standard spiel is, yes, it can happen through oral sex, but the chances are so much lower uh, that that it certainly would come under the under the context of safe versa. No, I, I'm completely right, and I, I think you know um, if if there's kind of a construct that's helpful in the discussion is, is you know sexual harm reduction. So we talk about uh, harm reduction for uh, substance use, and I think again it's the issue. You know, it's also um, I like to say that for a lot of people, you know, safer sex is giving up your least favorite behavior. So there's a certain amount of bargaining that people want to do, and so. Well, I'm not doing that, so I can do this. And there's almost the scripts that people have in their head about what they're allowing, you know, or feeling uh, comfortable with. So, so I think it's hard, you know. If first, you know, it's always the context. So when wearing a clinical hat, if I'm talking one to one to somebody, you know, it's you know, how important, you know, how important is this behavior in your repertoire of behaviors, and you know, or is this happening once? Or are you saying that this is now a strategy that you're going to be doing on you know indefinite basis, and you know, because even a minuscule risk, if it's taken on a recurrent basis, can can have appreciable uh, consequences. But but the individual per contact risk is, is certainly extremely low. I would be very happy. Thank you for your talk. And uh, when you talk about microepidemics, I would like to, uh, if you can share, how do you assess, I mean, how do you approach like societies like Peru, that is highly Catholic, Senegal, I believe it's Maslin. How do you deal with the uh, stigma? And uh, I mean, do you work with anthropologists? Uh, you have um, the support of the government. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you approach the community? Yep. Because um, those are important issues, not only religious, you know, poverty, I don't know, economics, if you, if people don't have money to eat, if you give them the um, lubricant for free. I mean, but how do you, oh. can you give us an example? Sure. Yeah, no, well, that's a, it's a great question. Uh, you know, um, I, I don't have um, much direct knowledge in, in Senegal about some of the nuances. I mean, I know a few mm -hmm. Senegalese researchers are doing some very excellent work, Dr. Suleiman Maboub. But uh, Peru is an interesting example, as you say, uh, Catholic country. But, but, but they uh, very early on had a, a couple of very um, proactive um, academics who are um, um, both extremely well trained and have different approaches. So there's uh, uh, at the uh, Universidad Cayetano, uh, there's um, uh, um, uh, um, Jorge uh, Cáceres, uh, uh, and, and he's, a, uh, um, he's an MD, but a behavioral social scientist has really um, um, been a follower of Frarian kind, kinds of approaches and has really done community mobilization, much more focusing on mental health issues. Another phys physician, Jorge Sanchez, um, uh, who is director of the national program in Peru for a number of years, um, did training at the University of Washington, Seattle, which is very biomedically based. And, and in Peru has been a site for um, um, uh, interventions on major um, uh, herpes suppression study. The intervention was not successful, but the actual study conduct was done exceedingly well in terms of you know, recruiting a high-risk cohort, uh, people being followed up, people get, getting triaged into appropriate care with the study. Uh, they're a vaccine research site, and then they're, um, they have three sites in Peru where they're doing these pre-exposure prophylaxis studies. They have been very effective, and again, you know, not, not um, having worked, uh, done primary work in Peru, they've been very effective with the government of convincing them that in the long run, this, despite um, some traditional values, that um, getting traction on prevention is going to make a uh, big difference in the national epidemic. They've, you know, they early on had data about bisexuality, about transmission to women, so they point out that to uh, slow down the epidemic among men of sex with men could have impact uh, for, for families as, as well. And the government has, as to my knowledge, has not impeded any, any of their work. And they do, both groups collaborate, you know, are broad-based teams uh, with multilateral collaborations. Um, you know, in every 
every society, it's, uh, there are different nuances. John and I certainly know that there are challenges uh, working in India, even though um, we, um, the public health community, at least over the past few years, has again recognized that if you um, uh, have um, legal barriers towards people uh, being comfortable about um, expressing their sexuality, it makes things much more covert and much harder to engage people with positive prevention programs. But there are a lot, you know, there are a lot of um, challenges to, you know, I'd love to be able to say that if you promote human rights, you, um, you end the epidemic, and that's not, not going to necessarily be true. I mean, we have high rates of resurgent HIV um, in Europe, uh, you know, in, in many, many very uh, enlightened um, um, sites where there's, you know, access to health care and there are reasonable policies in terms of uh, inc inclusion of uh, sexual gender minorities in the general population. So I think that's it's part of the part of the process. One, it's the right thing to do. Two, and and I think that it, it, it at least gives you a running start to be able to get people into care and into services. But you know, um, sexuality is is you know is very complex, as we all know.